Why don't we stand for opening prayer, and then we'll remain standing for our first song. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be together this morning. So thankful for all your blessings. Thankful, Father, to be able to be in this worship service this morning. We pray that as we offer up our worship to you, that our worship will be in spirit and in truth, and your name will be uplifted and glorified, and, and we'll be strengthened as well. Father, we're so thankful for everybody that's here and uh, for the ability and, and frame of mind to want to be in the worship service. We're mindful of those that have special needs this morning, Father, and we pray your special blessings upon those. Father, we know that we have amongst our number of those that are having health issues, and uh, you know who they are and, and what those needs are, and we pray that you be with them and continue to bless them and watch over them. And for those that have lost loved ones, Father, we pray that you continue to put your comforting arms around them and help us to be a strength for each other. Be with us as we worship you this morning and help us, Father, to again focus on worshiping and serving you. Thank you so much again for all your blessings. We especially thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm satisfied with just cars below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the rents will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander. But walk the streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested. And like the prophet, my pillow was stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor, or deserted, or lonely. I'm not discouraged, I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander. But walk the streets that are pure as gold. And be seated, please. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong, farther Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, 
live in the sunshine will understand it all by and by when death has come and taken our loved ones it leaves our homes so lonely and drear then do we wonder why others prosper living so wicked year after year farther along we'll know all about it farther along we'll understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine We'll understand it all by and by. Faithful till death, said our loving Master, a few more days to labor and wait. Toils of the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through the beautiful gate farther along we'll know all about it farther along we'll understand why cheer up my brother live in the sunshine will understand it all by and by when we see jesus coming in glory when he comes from his home in the sky then we shall meet him in that bright mansion We'll understand it all by and by. Farther along, we'll know all about it. Farther along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine will understand it all by and by. <clears throat> As we get ready to take up the Lord's Supper this morning, let's sing How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son to make a wretch his treasure. pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away, as wounds which mar the chosen one, bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders, ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there, until it was accomplished. His dying 
death has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this no with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom this morning as we prepare to take the bread which represents his body and the cup that represents his blood, I want us to focus on peace. In John 14, 27, it reads, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives, but uh, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In John 16, 33, it reads, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Do not be anxious, oh, Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ. There's so many times that our, the Word of God rep, uh, talks about peace. It talks about the God of peace, the gospel of peace, the fruit of the Spirit being peace. It's blessed are the peacemakers. And I want us to focus as we fix our eyes on the cross today as we fix our eyes on what Jesus has done for us, has given, eternal, given us eternal life, given us peace. I want us to remember what that peace means. Please bow with me. Dear Lord, we're gathered today so thankful, so thankful to, to fix our eyes on the cross so thankful that you have given us peace that you are the God of peace that you bring the gospel of peace Lord that the spirit has peace that the fruit of the spirit is peace and Lord we pray that we remember that as we fix our eyes on you that when we avert our gaze that when we look elsewhere when we look to the problems of the world we lose that peace. We forget that we have that peace, Lord. Allow us, let us, help us to fix our eyes on you, the giver of peace. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Is there anyone that doesn't have this, by the way? Good? Awesome. And I, today I'm talking about peace because it's, it's, it, it is something that weighs heavily on my heart. It is something that I think about daily. Uh, something that I pray about daily is, is finding peace, allowing God's peace to live in me. And when I think back to why I, I, I'm always thinking about his peace, I'm going to share a couple things with you today. 
And it's because as a human, as a person, we're not inherently peaceful, right? Instantly, immediately, we can think of the things that we struggle with, the things that we stress about, the world around us, what's going on, whether it's political or, or personal. You know, I, I lost my father as a teen. I struggled with mental health. I've been in plenty of fights and I've come close to death. There was moments where I was homeless. There were times that I watched my wife on the brink of death. And of course, it may sound always, always sound simple, but financial troubles, you know, there's a reason why money is the root of all evil. And there's so many things that, that cause us to lose peace. So many things that happen in the world. But it's, it's, it's funny because I always think that I need to pray for peace and not for my problems to go away, right? Because God doesn't talk about removing the problems. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible that says, uh, on earth you shall have no problems, right? It talks about having peace and walking with him. And so when I think about my peace, I realize when I look to the perfect example of a, of a person, of a human, when I look at Jesus in the most unpeaceful time of his life, he went to God in prayer and said, please take this away. He asked for it the way we often do, please remove this from my life. But in his very next breath, he said, I will follow your will. It is your will, not mine. And so as we focus on him, let us remember that, that as a person, as a human, that we have struggles every day, that we've been through so much, but God has given us peace. He has allowed us to have peace. All we have to do is seek him, to look for him, and every day, he gives us that. Please bow with me. Dear Lord, we're so incredibly grateful that you have given us peace. You are the God of peace and have given us the gospel of peace. And yes, this world is not our home. Let us not forget what you have done for us, that you have conquered death. The very thing that comes for us all, you have already beaten it. And we pray that today, as we listen to your word, as we learn, as we worship, as we fellowship, that we focus on that peace that you have given us. This life is not meant to be easy. And you showed us the example of what we should strive to be when on this earth. And we pray that we follow that example, that yes, if you can take this cup, take this burden from us that we are struggling with, that we have, are going to struggle with, that we are going to stress about. Yes, if it can be removed, Lord, but only through your will, your perfect and flawless will, your perfect plan. We pray today that we fix our eyes on the cross, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. And now is just the time where we'll pray for offering so that we can continue to do the good works our Lord has called us to do. Please bow with me. Dear Lord, I say thankful first, always, because how can we not? You have given us everything. You have given us life over death. And we pray that wherever we are in life, we remember that sacrifice you have given to us, Lord. Remember to give to you that we have faith and we do good works through faith, not because we are saved by what we do, but because you have saved us. We choose to do the good work you've called us to do. We pray that we give freely and openly because we know you have given us everything. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Right, and now, if we can stand and sing, we'll get our kids to this Sunday school. Okay, let's stand and sing Psalm 1. Jesus loves me. While they go off to class, then we'll sing our, have one more song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. 
little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And now before the lesson, these are the days of Elijah. And I want to challenge you, um, if you've never thought about the message of this song, um, go home this afternoon and think about it a little bit. I, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great song, and it took me a while before I really got what the, what the message of the song was, but I, I, I think I, it does speak to me now. And, and so let's sing the days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, so we are the voice in the desert, crying, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as wide in your world. And we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Well, um, you know, I think every word that the gospel writers are writing is, is important. I, you know, I'm, I, you would say, well, of course, but what I mean is I don't think there's extraneous details. I don't think they're telling us things there that, you know, just for color and that sort of thing. But they're actually telling us things that are important. And that's important to remember, I think, today because we're at one of those sayings from the cross that might not strike us from the very beginning as being very theological. Um, but there's a reason why John includes this, and he doesn't include others. We know he doesn't include others because Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about sayings that John doesn't talk about. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about some, th or, or don't include all the sayings that John does. And so the only way we get up with this, like, seven sayings from the cross is that we mix-mash all the Gospels together. But they're all trying to do something unique in their own uh, writing. And so now here we are in John chapter 19, and there's this passage that happens after they are ter um, casting lots for the uh, clothing of Jesus. And it says that near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Okay, well, anytime you move from one language to another, you're going to have some translation issues, and uh, this is pretty good. Uh, I think all in all, the, probably one of the best around translations is the, uh, the New uh, International Version, the NIV. But there's still some things here that uh, 
you know, where we lose maybe just a little bit of a nuance here. First of all, uh, the dear woman, that is an interpretation by the translators that I agree with. Um, the word itself is simply woman. And so in a lot of the versions, you'll just have him say, woman, behold your son. And that strikes us, I think, as uh, native English speakers, that strikes us as a little bit rude, maybe. Um, maybe a little bit distant. Um, it, but he's kind of holding his mother at arm's length and saying, woman, you know, you know, woman, bring me a drink. You know, that's kind of what you expect after you hear a, an address like that in our culture, but not in this culture. And so to get it across, uh, the NIV, I, I think properly so, says, dear woman which is more what he would actually be saying. But it's also interesting, that last sentence, from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Uh, very literally, uh, from that time, he took her into his own. Um, so we, we can say the idea of his home because that's the context of it, but the language actually might leave it just a little bit more open than that, that he brings her into his own. He brings her into his life. Uh, he, from that time on, you know, he, he's got his arms around her. He's, he's taking care of her. So that's, that's kind of the import of this um, passage that I want to be sure that we don't miss, is that Jesus is being thoughtful, respectful, loving in dealing with his mother, and that the disciple is not just giving her um, the spare room in the basement that's got its own separate entrance and that sort of thing. He's bringing her into his own. She's, she's being uh, truly adopted into his life. He's being truly adopted into hers. There's two uh, ways to really read this text. Of course, there's more than two. But anyways, um, the, you can kind of divide them into two different ways. And I actually think that both of them are right. Uh, the first one is we could take it as just pure history. Just John's just telling us the events around the cross, and so we learn this pure history, and part of the reason why we learn this pure history is because Jesus is our model, and so we're going to look at this, and it's going to teach us something about Jesus and something about what we ought to do as Jesus followers, and I think that's, that's a perfectly good reading. I also think that there's a second way of reading it, or you might even think of it as a deeper way of reading it, where it's history with intent. Um, Again, the, the writer's making a choice of what he tells. All the biblical writers do this. They're making a choice of what they tell. They're not just given everything that Jesus did. This particular author, at the end of his gospel, in fact, will even say that there were many other signs and wonders that Jesus did that I could have included. Um, but, in fact, if I included them all, the world couldn't hold all the books. But I wrote these so that you might believe. So I wrote these selectively. I pick the ones that I'm telling you about. And so he's, he's picking the things that are going to help us understand. And part of that, he thinks, is this interchange with Jesus and his mother and the fact that the mother and the beloved disciple are going to go together. John is a very interesting gospel. I mean, they're, they're all interesting, but John is interesting in a weird way. He does things in a different way. One of the things he does, which is really easy to miss, we all know that Jesus' mother is Mary. But we know that from reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't name her. He just calls her mother, the, the mother of Jesus. And so uh, when we first saw her in Cana, she's the mother. Jesus' mother is there. There's a wedding going on. Jesus is, and his disciples come, and his mother is there. And his mother says to him, hey, they're out of wine. And he says, woman, same sort of expression as this, dear woman, dear woman, mommy, uh, it's really not my time. It's not my time. And she then turns to the other people and she says, do what he says. And so he says, fill up with water. They fill up these six uh, big vases with water and it turns into wine and you know there's the first sign they end up saying that's the first sign then John does this thing with the signs that's kind of interesting to trace out the second sign that he talks about is um, the healing of the official son where they come to him and they say this boy is so sick that he's going to die 
And so Jesus forestalls his death. He doesn't die, but instead he heals him. Then a third sign is, uh, comes up later. There's a paralytic at a pool. And the paralytic can't get into the pool to be healed. And so Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And he says, yeah, I do. He says, I just can't get in there. And so Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. And that gets resistance. Uh, the Jewish leaders become involved at this point. And they're trying to say, you know, he shouldn't have done that. This is a Sabbath violation. And a lot of other things kind of come from that. That's the third one. Then the fourth sign is all connected with the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, the, the five loaves, the two fishes, and he feeds these 5,000 people. And that evening, he appears to his disciples and he walks on the water. And then that next morning, the people are realizing, oh, he must have crossed the lake and gone to the other side. And so that whole event of those days is, is the, sort of the fourth sign. Then what the Gospels often do is they kind of come back and they sort of retread where they've already been. So the fifth sign is like the third one. The third one, remember, was a paralytic who's healed, and then the leaders question him about that. In the fifth side, a blind man is healed, a man who's been blind by birth, and again, the leaders question him. There's kind of a, an official inquiry, if you will, and the idea that Jesus is somehow breaking God's law by doing this sort of thing. But in this one, it gets a little more intense because the paralytic healing, um, there, there's just kind of a like, well, surely, you know, this, this guy's from God. But the, the one with the blind man is like, how can this guy do this if he's not with God? We all know, that's amazing that you don't know this. You know, he, he said, well, who is this? And he's like, it's amazing that you don't know how he does this. Of course you know how he does this. this is, and so it's, it's much more strident on the, per, on the part of the person who um, has been healed. You can also see that the other people were more afraid of the leaders at this point. His parents don't even want to talk about it. His parents says, he's of age, ask him. You know, and, the, and the reason why they say that isn't because they don't know the answers to the questions. The reason why they say it is because they're afraid they're going to get kicked out of the synagogue if they truthfully answer the questions. And so that you can see that the fear then is ramped up. The sixth sign is a lot like the second sign. Remember the second sign, we heal, uh, Jesus heals the official son who was on the verge of death. At the sixth sign, the story of Lazarus, the word comes to Jesus that Lazarus is on the verge of death. But rather than do what he did at the second sign, where he forestalls that death, he waits. He purposefully waits and he doesn't go to Bethany until Lazarus dies. And then he goes and he raises him from the dead. So again, it's like the sixth one is like the second one, but it's ramped up even more. And so then the seventh one is the cross event itself, his, his passion. And on, and off of these, you'll see these things, they kind of tie up in certain ways. One of the ways that this ties up is just the second time in the Gospel of John that we read about Jesus' mother. She was there when he initiated his ministry. Now she's there at the end. And we have this discussion about my time, my hour, as it sometimes is translated. But it's literally my time. It's, it's, a, it's an appointed time. Don't think of it as like a clock, uh, sort of chronos. Think of it as kairos time, which is it's the right time. When will you do this? You know, you'll do it when it's fitting at the appropriate time. So that's not necessarily a time that's set by a clock. So Jesus says, first of all, it's not my time. But now this is his time. His time has come. And he said that over and over. His time has come. And knowing that his time has come, he's taking care of his mother. In the first one, his mother is saying to people, listen to him, do what he says. In the last one, his mother is doing what he says. Um, he's, he's actually performing an adoption here at the cross and she uh, wordlessly, without comment, uh, does what it is that Jesus is uh, performing here. And so we, and there's also kind of an interesting uh, interplay with wine itself at Cana. You know, Jesus turns the water into wine. Here we're going to have him later being offered wine, which he accepts, which he drinks, uh, I think so that he can speak, but we'll get to that when we get there. Um, he, he takes this wine so that he can speak. And then when he is finally stabbed in the Gospel of John, what comes out is this mixture of blood and, and water. And it's, uh, you know, this conversation of wine throughout the Gospel of John causes us to, to, to expect that 
Uh, this wine, which is one of the images of the Messianic kingdom, is something that Jesus is going to bring. And as we read about what happens to him on the cross, we get the impression that John is telling us that all of this symbolism is coming true here. That, that this is where it's really happening. This, this is the moment. Not that resurrection is somehow lesser than this. It's not. But sometimes we can sort of make resurrection be so important that the death is almost an afterthought. They're really both extremely important. And so, the, in, in fact, the very center of our existence, the very center of our def definition of who we are as Christians, okay? So, believe it or not, I say that as introduction because that, that, that orients us to what John is trying to do. Uh, this is not just a, an interesting detail. Just sort of a footnote. Oh, by the way, while Jesus was up there doing high theology, he also made sure his mom got taken care of. Now, it's more than that. He's, he's hooked these things together, and his mother has been hooked into this story. And so, although we can look at it as pure history, with concern for friends and family whenever we're suffering, I think that's legitimate. I, th I think it does say that. I, th I think we should be concerned about our friends and family. Be concerned that we take care of them the right way. Uh, if I put on my other hat, I would say, guys, um, write your wills. I don't care how young you are, but if you're married, write a will. If you have kids, especially write a will. Because this is, this is taking care of the people when you're gone. It's, it's the structure that you can provide for them. In this day and age, Jesus would have been responsible for his mother because apparently Joseph was dead. Uh, I don't know of anybody who really disagrees with that, although we don't have a verse. But it does seem that Jesus has a responsibility to his mother. And once he's gone, you know, the, the man's supposed to take care of you. This is ancient society. I'm sorry, women, this is not 20th century, 21st century. But at this particular time, you're father takes care of you, then your husband takes care of you, and if your husband falls out of the scene, then your sons take care of you. And the truth of the matter is, there's no social security, there's no governmental safety net. And so if your family doesn't do that, you're really struggling. It's, it's really a bad place to be. And so Jesus doesn't want to leave her without a husband, without a son, but he wants that son to be this beloved disciple. That's another interesting thing about John. You say, who's the beloved disciple? And everybody say, well, it's John. By the way, I think that's right. But when the beloved disciple is identified, we're never told who he is. And it's as if what John is wanting to do at the moments when he talks about the beloved disciple is he wants to take that person and make him into a type that any of us could sort of put ourselves in that situation. That the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loves. Well, how many of Jesus' disciples does he love? He loves them all. Yeah. And so... Knowing that he loves them all, I can put myself in that position with the beloved disciple. I can put myself there and I can say, you know, take care of people that need taken care of. And the emphasis about the beloved, beloved disciple is at the Lord's Supper and at the cross and at the resurrection, places like this. So the beloved, the beloved disciple talk comes out when you say, well, why don't you just say his name? His name is shorter than the phrase beloved disciple. So once again, it seems like John's trying to do something with this phrase beloved disciple. Just like he's trying to do something by uh, calling the mother of Jesus nothing but mother. Just his mother. Okay, so we've got this concern for family and friends. It's very easy to become self-centered when we're suffering. Um, I do all the time. I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's a human weakness. But when I'm sick, the world is all about me. When, when I'm sick, I, I'm just that way. I, you know, if I'm cold, I think we ought to turn the thermostat up because I'm sick. Come on, gone. You know, let's, 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 let's take care of me. And, and I think that, you know, if things are too loud, they ought to be turned down. I just, I just kind of think the world should just pause for a moment and take care of me. But when Jesus is being crucified, he's, he's not just thinking about his own comfort. In fact, it doesn't, I don't see him really ever thinking about his comfort. He's forgiving the people who are doing this to him and he's looking at Mary and he's taking care of her. And so if nothing else, it is a moral example for us. It does show us uh, this, this amazing thing. And I've never, I've never reached it. Um, I've, I've uh, tried and I've always failed, but I continue to try. I continue to try to keep in mind literally the image of Jesus because that's the standard for us to live to, okay? 
So if we are to take up our cross and follow him daily, then it seems that part of what should inform us is what he did when he was on the cross. So that, that's part of what should inform my discipleship. Um, so, so, so it's a high standard. It's a, it's a very difficult calling, but it's one that I accept. Now, Mary herself, I'm going to call her Mary because I know that's her name. John almost acts like he doesn't know. But Mary herself, uh, very consistent with the uh, uh, Lord's Supper comments here. Uh, she is chosen by God. She is highly favored. She calls herself the handmaiden of the Lord. She and God are tight. She is chosen by God, but that doesn't mean she's going to be coddled by God. To be chosen by God, to be highly favored by God, does not mean that life gets easier. In fact, biblically, it oftentimes means that life gets harder. Remember, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Fiddler on the Roof, uh, there's, there's a very famous scene in there where Tevye is uh, he, he, Tevye's a Jewish person living in Russia, and it's a rough time at this time to be Jewish in Russia, which it pretty much always has been, but th this is a rough time. And so he's talking about being the chosen people. And he kind of goes through their history a little bit, and he says in this prayer to God, he says, you know, it's not so great being your chosen people. What are we chosen for? Why don't you choose somebody else for a while? You know, because being the chosen people of God does not necessarily lead us into a life of ease. Uh, it, it doesn't take away pain. In fact, there's this, there's this almost symbiosis, I suppose, where being chosen by God means that we are going to have pain and we're going to experience and we're supposed to demonstrate something to the world through the way that we accept pain, through the way that we endure it. We don't whine like the pagans do. We don't mourn like the Gentiles do. Uh, when we suffer, we have the image, uh, the image of the one that we follow is the image of one who suffers. And that's, that's not common, really. If you look around at a lot of uh, philosophies of the world, it's, it's not really common that the place where we really get what it is we get from them is in the middle of great suffering. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's uh, very much at the other places. But the Gospels are very much centered on the suffering of Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's the first move, which is to say, let's just look at it as, uh, as an example and kind of how he fits it into the Gospels. But the second move that I want to do, which I think is, is very much intentional here, is that he's doing this with deeper intentions. He's doing this to be a deep metaphor. Okay, now here's what I mean by deep metaphor. I don't know if this is a real thing. I may be making this up. But a lot of metaphors are really easy to see. You know, they're, they're just so obvious. And, and so you're, you're running that metaphor. And, and I'm not saying that that doesn't necessarily communicate things. But deep metaphors, I think, run at the level. And this is what I'm trying to talk about here. It doesn't necessarily leap out to us right away that this is a metaphor. Only maybe later do we go, ah, okay, there might have been. Do you think he's trying to say something, for example, by, by not naming her? And by giving her kind of a generic title, mother. In fact, the word for that is just the word woman. Uh, by giving her such a generic term. And now we don't even name the disciple. We just call him the beloved disciple. The disciple whom Jesus loves. And we work it out through other passages who that is. But for whatever reason, John doesn't want to tell us. So is he doing something here on a metaphorical level by leaving these two people unnamed? But describing them in these broad terms, is he bringing us into something there to help us to imagine, for example, the fellowship of the cross? That the cross brings people into a fellowship that they otherwise wouldn't have had. And I think he is doing that. I think he's doing that exactly. That we are a cruciform body. What is it that we most look like? If we're really following Christ the way we should, we, we look like the cross. Uh, there's other places where Paul, for example, will talk about what it is that you order your life from. If I get into Galatians, I'll talk about this. In Galatians 6, around about verse 16. And he talks about the, the rule, the standard, the measuring stick that you live your life by. And it is shockingly not Scripture, which is usually what we mean by the word canon, because that's a word that he uses there. But the standard, the measuring rule, the thing that we hold up to make sure we're attaching to, is the cross. 
He says it's the cross of Christ which is the standard. And so, yes, I might look in a situation and say, what does the Bible tell me to do about this or that? Uh, what does the Bi how does the Bible tell me to act in this particular circumstance? But what I'm primarily supposed to be doing is, what does the cross tell me about what to do in this situation? Do I look like a soldier betraying Jesus? Or do I look like Jesus? Do I look like a religious leader emphasizing my interpretation of the scripture, even if somebody's got to die? Or do I look like Jesus? Do I look like an evildoer being hung on the cross? Or do I look like the one who's saving them while he does this? So that's the standard for us, is we're looking at the cross. We're looking at how Jesus dies. We're looking at how he survives this. And that is the high calling that we measure our lives by. Well, in addition to that, we see here this adoption at the cross. This is an adoptive action. And adoption is a really big word later on as we go into the, uh, into the theology of the church. The church is made up of people who have been adopted into Jesus' family. It's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. John himself at the very beginning says, To all who received him, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, he gave the power to become children of God. Okay, we're, here's, you know, I'm trying to, to say something which is so old and it's so familiar and sometimes it's really hard to get to the depth of what things are when they're old and they're so familiar. Children of God, you've heard that all your life. Children of God, naturally. But why not just a word like members? Why not a word just like citizens? Or followers? Or adherents? Or practitioners? You know, you don't hear about the family of Buddha. You don't hear about the children of Buddha. You know, it, it's not a phrase that you hear in other contexts. But in Christianity, we've become so used to it that I'm afraid it trips off of our tongue without us kind of stopping for a moment and saying, wait a minute, that's different. God isn't just telling us how to live. He's telling us how to be empowered to become a part of his family. To be adopted by him. To be the children of God. This is why Jesus came. It's for us to be the children of God. But we can exalt things to where being a children of, child of God becomes for us almost just like a title without meaning. It's not a title without meaning. It is an incredibly profound status. God wants us in his family. And Jesus accomplishes this recombination of families at the cross. That's where it happens. And we become a family formed by the cross, shaped like the cross. Which means we treat each other like people... Think about, how do you think the beloved disciple treats Jesus' mother after this? How do you think he treats her? And how do you think the mother of Jesus looks at and reacts to the beloved disciple after this. This is the place where they were put together. Jesus is the one who put them together. And it's at the point when he's dripping his blood on the ground that he performs this adoption. What would happen to us if we honestly got a hold of that? That, that we are siblings in Christ, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, not just in sort of a sounding like Amish people from the 18th century, but in the sense of getting what Scripture is trying to say, and how would that have us treat one another if we truly begin to understand that I am in a family which has been formed by the death of Jesus? You see what I mean? I'm in a family that has been formed by the death of Jesus. That's what put me into this family. And it gives me a little bit of clue about how I ought to be treating you. And it gives me a little clue about what my obligations to you are. They're pretty profound. Jesus is passing that, that obligation on to me, but also that privilege. It's wonderful to be a part of this family. But I also want to be sure that, that I do right by you. This image of adoption at the cross, Paul picks it up later, and I want to read a, a few verses from Romans chapter 8 just because they're so appropriate to this. And this is where he's literally talking about this idea, the spirit of adoption. Okay, I'm going to start reading about verse uh, 
15. Let's see. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, okay, the spirit of adoption. Um, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Those are our dear and informal family names, okay? The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I think if we really understand that we're cruciform people, we will not struggle anymore with why do I suffer? You know, we, I, I'm, I'm not saying those answers become easy, but what... The problem with this a lot of times is expectations. If we have the expectation that I'm going to come to Jesus, I'm going to have a wonderful life, I think what we're forgetting is, well, what is it that formed us into this group? It, it was an act of great suffering that formed us into this group. Where was my adoption performed? My adoption was at the cross. So why should I ever expect that following Jesus is somehow going to magically make my life better? Going to make my bank account fill up. Going to make my wife look at me longingly. Going to make my children look at me with nothing but respect. Going to make my, my boss say to me, would you like a raise? I know I just gave you one last week, but would you like another? You know, why, why would I be thinking that this is how life's going to treat me when the context at which all of this happened is the cross? So instead of saying, God, why are all these things happening to me? I maybe ask a better question. God, what should I be doing in the face of this? You know, so, so that trouble doesn't present some sort of theological answer that needs to be understood, why the bad things happen to good people, but instead lays before us an ethical dilemma. What is it that I do now? What is it that I do? I don't need to understand this. I just need to be faithful through it. And so what is it that I do? I can tell you that... Um, when I think that way, I do better with my suffering. When I remember that suffering is part of what I get when I'm adopted by God. Yes, co-heirs with Christ. Absolutely. And yes, this wonderful... But, but you see what, what Paul said? If we share in his sufferings. So that's not optional. That's our path. That's our path. And following God and being a, a part of his family may actually make things more difficult. Okay, um, let me just, um, I opened a lot of doors there. I'm not going to close them, but I just want to go down one of the doors that gets opened. One of the doors that gets opened is I am suggesting, and, and, and I'm, I'm arguing uh, pretty strongly, that the cross is the moment uh, upon which history turns. Um, and, and not just world history, not just A.D., B.C., that sort of thing, but that, that the cross is the moment where before I am outside of Christ and now if I could place myself in that position of beloved disciple, I, I actually get adopted into this family. And this, this language of adoption, like I say, it gets carried on through the scripture. So this is the point where this adoption happens. And if I get that, if I see the work of what Jesus is doing here, I think it will help me on these questions of form versus function. Because sometimes we think of Jesus uh, building a church. And yes, that's Matthew 16, but it's not the typical language that's used. That's not typically what he's talking about. What he's typically talking about is a family. What he's typically talking about, hey, your mother and brothers are outside and they think you're crazy and they want to take you home. He says, well, who are my mothers and brothers? My mother and brother are the people who are here who are listening to God's word. Who is my intimate family? It's the ones who are obeying God. And so that, that's where Jesus has always been with this. And that's how he talks about this. We tend to think of following Jesus in organizational blocks. But scripture is not very organizational. It's not really, it, there's no Robert's Rules of Order uh, shortly after the Gospels. There's, there's, there's no Leviticus, which structures for us exactly how our worship bottled up. There's, there's nothing in there that tells us precisely. I mean, Paul, for goodness sakes, couldn't you have just written one more letter and told us exactly what the organization of a church should be? Uh, give us the, the lines of authority, who's under who and who does what. Nowhere does that happen. Instead, we get things like it's a plant that grows up overnight. It's like a treasure that you find in the field. And you give everything up to get that. 
It's a family. It's mothers and beloved disciples joined together at the cross who will continue to follow Jesus with suffering because they are co-heirs with him. We get what he got so that we will get what he gives. And so we, we, we follow him in this way. So we're, we're, not, we're not primarily fun focused then on form, but we're incredibly focused on function. We're incredibly focused on are we doing the, the things that Jesus wants us to do? Are we actually a family or are we content? Do we think our work of restoration is content if we somehow define and implement a proper form? Which doesn't ever seem to be Jesus' big concern. But he's very concerned about how we relate to God, about how we believe him, about how we treat one another. And we could do that inside of a perfectly non-objectionable form. So having the form doesn't seem to be nearly as important as the function. Now, I'm not denying that there's uh, organizational reality. Of course there is. You put people together and they're going to form organizations. They're going to form uh, power structures. That's just sociology. That's just psychology. It's just the way it is. In the 60s, there used to be some experiments. People said, oh, we're going to take 30 of us, you know, 15 guys and 15 women. We're going to go live in a commune. We're all going to be farmers, even though we all grew up in the city and none of us know how to do this. But we're, we're all going to go out there and we're just going to live off the land. We're all just going to love one another. And, you know, all the people that kind of studied and follow up on these things found that whenever you went back, you tended to find like 15 couples. That even though there was going to be everybody sort of like free loving, the truth of the matter is those organizations tend to rise and those relationships tend to form. We do those things naturally. Anytime you get any number of people together, they're going to say, how are we going to do this? You know, who's going to decide what? You want to, you want to see a mess, you know, get 20 people together, you know, who think like I do and say, where do you want to go for lunch? You know, that they'll starve. And so, and so you, you, you somehow have to, to you, you fall into some structure. And part of what happens is there's some people that aren't afraid to say, let's go to Wendy's. And, and then most of the other people say, yeah, that's all right. You know, and they don't really mind, but, but they're never going to say it. If you leave it up to them, you'll never go anywhere. Structure happens. Structure is necessary. We need to have structure. But structure is never the point. That's not what God wants us to do, go into all the world and build correct structures, go into the world and bring disciples together and put them in properly formed churches. That's, that's never been the command. It's go into all the world and teach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to observe everything that I've observed you. And oh, there it is, there's all the form. Okay, yeah, but do you see what order it was in? Do you see where it is? In, in that structure of things, if we concede that that's even what he's talking about. Make them disciples and then make them get the forms right. I'm, don't hear me, every, I, I, I have trouble with this. People hear me, oh, so you just want everything loosey-goosey and you just don't care how things work at all. No, what I'm saying is we are too quick to look at things like that and think that that's the goal. That, that if I just have... A, a player at every position. I got a right fielder, a center fielder, a left fielder, and I got a third baseman, a shortstop, a second baseman, a first baseman, a pitcher, and a catcher. Great, I got a baseball team. Except none of them can catch or throw or hit. Okay? So what does it matter if they can't do those things? The truth of the matter is what we will oftentimes see in a team that performs well, sorry for the sports analogy if you don't follow it, but I think you can still get the point is the teams that really do well are not primarily saying we need a first, big one who's, a first baseman who's big and tall and left-handed and we need a center fielder who's... This. No, they tend to pick the people who hit the best and say, let's be sure we got them in the game. And sometimes the form takes second place and you got a guy playing in a position that most people would say he's out of position. But the reason you got him there is because he does the actual function of the game really well. And we're emphasizing the function and if we get too caught up on the form, then we've got a team that looks really great at the team picture but can't beat anybody. So I'm not as concerned about what we look like at our team picture. That's just not my big concern. My big concern is, do we handle suffering the way that Jesus has shown us we ought to handle it? Do I treat my brothers and sisters? Do I treat my brothers and sisters? Is there a gender thing possibly here? Do I treat the women as if they're a mother? Do I treat the guys as if they're a beloved disciple? 
If that works for you, take it. And if it doesn't, don't worry about it. Because in any event, this adoption is performed in the words of John with anonymous type people that I think he's encouraging us to imagine what it'd be like to be in one of those places. I'm not denying organizational reality. I'm just saying it's not our first concern. Rather, <clears throat> instead of structure, do we look like a loved disciple who's taking care of a dear woman? Is that what we're really looking like? Every time I've seen a church fail, it's because they lost the emphasis between form and function. They started worrying too much about the building and the grass and how it gets cleaned and who's going to make decisions and all these other things and they kind of forgot, are we acting like Jesus? Are we treating other people the way that Jesus would? Well, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We always have a time of invitation here at Kanawha City. We're going to do that now. If you want to make any kind of a public response, uh, and if you want to do it at this time, uh, feel free to come forward to the front while we stand and sing. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless fame, this gift of love and righteousness, Scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, The wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Thank you, Steve, for that lesson. We have some visitors here, so if they slipped in on you, these three right here, <laughs> 
make sure you uh, introduce yourself to them. We want to remember those uh, who lost a loved one, the Moore family, and the Weaver family. And remember those who are recovering from surgeries at home. Have a lot of sick too, so keep them in your mind. And please remember all the people in Ukraine going through a rough time. Bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, we come thanking you, Lord, for another day of life and for the opportunity to gather here this morning and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Lord, that for all those people in Ukraine, pray for those families who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are recovering from the surgeries and the sicknesses. Pray that you would go with each of us. Pray that you bless those who are traveling with safe travel and keep them, be with them always. We pray that you'd go with us to our separate homes and bring us back again at the point of time. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.